At today's lecture, I'm going to get into and talk about the early history of Rome, mostly get into like the development of Rome, the monarchy, just a little bit on that, not much on that. Uh, then I'll get mostly into the Roman Republic. Uh, if I have time, I might even get up to the Punic Wars, if I got time maybe uh, to do that uh, overall. Uh, I do got a new uh, PowerPoint slide I'm working on, of course, right now, History of Rome, uh, which you see the title page in the background of me. Uh, and um, so let me go ahead, of uh, course, first talk about uh, some of the background. Let me, of course, give you a definition first, I guess, of what the Romans are or who they were, basically. Uh, it's kind of like a European civilization, but it kind of was not. It was more like a state that was a, a multinational empire later. Uh, but it started out as an Italic European state. It was Italian or Euro European, like Northern Italian originally, that developed in ancient Italy. They developed in the Iron Age about, I'd say about 3,000 years ago, roughly, uh, the Roman civilization. And it would happen over time, it grew into this large state uh, that became the Roman Empire, uh, which would actually at one point control three continents, most of Europe, uh, up to like into like where England or Britain is, uh, they controlled, of course, most of North Africa from like pretty much from, you know, uh, Morocco all the way to Egypt was controlled. But they never really got into the southern part, like Sahara Desert. There's not much down there to go into. Southwest Asia uh, also actually pushing all the way uh, into um, like where Iraq is today. They controlled most of Iraq at one point, uh, the Romans. I guess further east, like in Eastern Europe, they may have gotten... I think all the way to the um, Northern Black Sea. And I think there's even a case where they think they maybe the Romans may have pushed close to the Caspian Sea at one point. So it's a pretty extensive empire. I believe that's correct. Somewhere between two and three million square miles was how large the Roman Empire got. So if you study about um, ancient times, uh, the Roman Empire was the largest empire really in ancient times. This is before, I guess, medieval modern times. Because, you know, you have other empires that come later, which are bigger, like the Mongol Empire, Russian Empire, British Empire, you know, that follow. That may have been about the amount of people, 60 million. I don't know if that's what the correct actual number is, but it's, they, I guess they estimate today maybe close to 60 million people that they may have lived under. But wasn't all like European peoples. European peoples, you had people in Africa that were under them, people in the Middle East, uh, that were under him. So it was a multi-ethnic empire. And most empires are multi-ethnic or multinational, usually. Yeah, it lasted a long time. I guess if you want to date it to like when they think it was founded, close to 753 BC, and then you go, go to about 476 when the Germanic peoples overran the West, you're looking at over a thousand years, 11, 1200 years maybe. Then if you throw in the Byzantine Empire, which continued in the East, like around Greece, Turkey, um, you go even further than that. You know, another thousand years you want to put in there. So the Romans were around a long time. They had a lot of influence on people today. You see it everywhere, like especially with architecture, you know, things like that. Uh, but even our government, which is a representative type democracy, is something that was kind of influenced by the Romans, uh, more or less. Uh, now, um, and I do have a map. Of course, I have other slides if you want to look at them later uh, that I've got. Um, of course, there's a map, you know, the size of the Roman state. You can see where Rome is about kind of in the central northern part of Italy. Uh, it's, where, it's actually not on the coast in that map. That's actually wrong. Rome's in the middle of the peninsula of Italy, but you can see it where it stretches. Like, I guess the eastern border, you know, was like the Tigris River uh, over here. Western border, the Atlantic Ocean. You can see where it goes uh, all the way to the Red Sea, going this way. But yeah, you can see it. They may have reached the Caspian Sea. And I think there's a theory they may have gotten up into the Crimean Peninsula at one point because they, they found like Roman um, you know, artifacts and ruins that are actually here uh, where the Bla uh, Northern Black Sea is. So they were all over. They never took over Germany, though, which was kind of a problem I'll kind of talk about later. But that was something they weren't successful with. But Danube River, Rhine River, those were kind of like natural uh, 
rivers here that were like borders between Germany and, of course, the uh, empire there uh, that you have later. Uh, let me get, in course, into uh, some other history, of course, about uh, the Roman state. Um, now, the history of the Romans uh, usually begins with the city of Rome. They always say that all the roads lead to Rome, right, which they did <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, and um, Rome was a city that started in northern Italy. Um, it actually is located, like I said, in the middle of the peninsula. It's not on the coast. That map's kind of wrong. But they were uh, this, the city of developed along the Tiber River, probably one of the most famous rivers in Italy. And uh, they, the date that they usually put it at is about 753 B.C., but that's a later date that I guess they kind of counted back to. Uh, it's kind of like in the Christian calendar. So they think that's the date maybe when Rome was founded by Romulus and Remus, but they're not sure if that's correct or not. Uh, but Rome, the, the early stages of Rome uh, are kind of comparable to the Greeks, uh, like in Greece. So they kind of started around the same time, uh, but the Greeks kind of took off faster than the Romans did. They took a while uh, to develop more uh, than anything. Uh, Rome was built around seven hills. Uh, I don't know if you know much about that. Uh, along the Tiber River uh, basin. Uh, and uh, the, the hill that's the most important one is the first one in the list there. You see the Palatine Hill. That's really the only one I guess you need to maybe know about uh, that's important. But it's the oldest hill, like where the city was first built. Like some of the buildings that are still there are probably some of the oldest that like date back to, uh, I guess, the Republic and all that. Uh, Capitoline Hill, Aventine Hill, Esquiline Hill, Kalian Hill, Corinthal Hill, and also the, the, the Mental Hill is the other one, of course, that they also have as well. Uh, but like I said, the Palatine is actually the oldest, uh, more or less. Now, of course, one of the most famous stories, of course, about uh, early, the early Roman state uh, was the fact that, if you know much about this, they believe that Rome was founded by these two twins that were no, known as Romulus and Remus. Uh, and I don't know if you know about them. They were believed to be part God. In fact, their father was supposed to be the god Mars, which is the Roman god of war, which the Greeks called Ares. So the Romans actually believed that they were maybe part God. Uh, and uh, the story goes that they were um, descendants of um, a king of, of, of Italy uh, from a city called Alba Longa. This was a city which um, was ruled by a people called the Latin peoples which were really one of the uh, stock peoples that made up the later Romans. His name was King Numitor, and Numitor uh, apparently, um, he was their grandfather, and uh, there was a story where he had a daughter uh, who was named Rhea Silvia, and Rhea Silvia was one day raped by the god Mars. Uh, and so the two, they had these two children uh, from that. And so basically, I guess the Romulus and Remus were considered like... Um, kind of demigods, I guess, to, to the Romans. I'll get to what the deal with the wolf is with them in a second. Uh, another part of the story, of course, King Numitor had this brother who was named Amulius, and uh, he basically took the throne uh, from Numitor, like had him in prison, basically. And the twins were, Armus and Remus were really young. I think they were only babies at the time. Or really, I guess maybe toddlers might be the better word. And he took them and put them in a basket and floated them on the Tiber River, hoping that they would drown, basically. And what happened was they, they came ashore on like a, the bank of the Tiber, and there was a she-wolf there, you see in the picture, now the so-called Capitoline wolf. And um, anyway, um, <clears throat> they suckled off of her, and they, they it was it became a miracle that they lived. Uh, and... Anyway, uh, that became a big symbol. The Capitoline wolf, you know, became a symbol, which I think later they add the, I think the wolf was a symbol. They later add the two kids in there later, I know, that kind of thing. But uh, what happened later was that uh, the twins grew up, they became older, uh, and then what happened was they went on to overthrow the uh, brother of King N Numitor, Amulius, and then they put their grandfather back on the throne is what they did. Uh, afterwards, what happened was Rimus and Remus then went on, they went on to found their own city nearby, uh, close to the Tiber River. It was near Alba Longa. 
And uh, I started building the city. Uh, and of course, in the story, uh, what happened was the two quarreled over, I think, the con either the construction of the walls that dealt with the city. Uh, and I think there was another story that they maybe fought over what they were going to name the city. Uh, and then what happened was Romulus killed Remus uh, in a quarrel. And Romulus went on to become the first king of the Romans. And so uh, the name of Rome, supposedly, uh, it comes from the name Romulus. At least that's the theory uh, about it. Although uh, there's another argument they have too uh, in the uh, epic poem, The Aeneid by uh, Virgil, uh, that there was actually, it may have been named after a woman. Because in, in the Aeneid, there's a woman named Roma. Uh, he was a kind of a character. So there's a theory it's either named after Romulus or it's named after a woman named Roma. So it's kind of a debate about that, which it is. All right. Um, um, oh, also, uh, after, of course, another thing happened to which I guess I'll mention just briefly about, but uh, Ramos would go on to populate the city. They didn't have any men at first. I don't know if you have a story about this, but Ramos had to actually go out and find women <laughs> to help populate the city. So there were nearby tribes that had a bunch of women. He asked, hey, you want to join us? And, of course, a lot of them wouldn't do it. Uh, and so he basically stole their women, brought them back. Uh, and so I think there are paintings made of this. They call it the rape of the S Sabine women. I think you may have heard of that, uh, where this tribe called the Sabines, I think they were called. Uh, he took a bunch of women and brought them back uh, to Rome. And um, the word rape is actually a word in uh, Latin that, that means uh, to seize is what it actually means. So, so anyway, so he had to populate Rome with different peoples. And so the Romans, I'll get into later, were, were not really one people, but a mixture of tribes throughout Italy at the time, overall. Uh, let me also talk about some of those. You see those primary sources, of course, that are on the bottom. Those are, of course, the primary sources that kind of deal with all uh, the early history of, of Rome. Uh, most of Roman history is a mix of like history, myths, legends. So it's kind of hard to figure out sometimes what the truth is about Rome. Uh, also, archaeology plays a big role also in um, you know studying about Rome. Roman history as well. Uh, let me uh, <clears throat> mention some authors. Now, those are like three I've got on the screen there. I've got Le Levy, uh, whose real name is Titus Levius, but they call him Levy, Virgil, Plutarch. They have a lot of information that goes into detail <clears throat> about the early Roman history, more or less. Levy's writing about 2,000 years ago. He's, he was living around the time of um, Emperor Augustus. Uh, and uh, he was a kind of a romantic style, you know, author, historian. And he wrote a series of books that was called The History of Rome. However, that's the, the name that they um, call it now. Sometimes even as like some of the earlier books, they'll say early history of Rome, like the first, I think, five books. will kind of call it that uh, more or less. But the actual Latin name a long time ago was, uh, you see there, Ab Urbe Condite Libre, which means in Latin, books from the founding of the city. Um, so it kind of starts from like when Rome was founded. And so it says go to Caesar. What I mean by that, it goes up to, I think it goes up like Julius Caesar. So he covers like eighth century to like the, First century BC, like something like 1700 years of history. Uh, that book, by the way, was, was extensive. It was a massive work, which must have taken years uh, for Levy to write it. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it originally had 142 books in it, which is like, I guess would be like equivalent to like 142 chapters. I just trying to read that. Uh, only 35 exist. So only about a fourth of it exists today. And um, most of it goes into like the early history of Rome, like going into like it talks about all the monarchs, like all the seven monarchs that reign over 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 Rome, uh, the early Roman state. Talks about the early Republic, uh, the different rulers, and it goes into like the Punic Wars, like that. This stuff exists still, like the Punic Wars. That part is still in it as well, because um, Levy is really big into uh, writing on the. Um, like the Punic War, especially dealing with like the uh, Hannibal 
Hannibal Barca, you know, the famous Carthaginian general. Of course, we'll get into later. He's got extensive stuff on, on that second Punic War, as they, of course, call it as well. And I think Levy is one of the main primary sources that goes into, like, the story of Romulus and Remus and that I kind of talked about uh, earlier. Uh, also, Virgil, you may have heard of him. He's a famous Roman poet, writing around the same time as Augustus, about 2,000 years ago. He wrote a, a famous Roman epic called the Aeneid. And what, it, what the Aeneid is, is this, it's this epic story that kind of is, is like an extension of the um, whole uh, Trojan War, you know, myths, stories, uh, epics that were, you know, that Homer had started a long time ago. It goes like into like the how the Trojan War ended, like with the Trojan Trojan horse and all that. Uh, it talks about the adventures of Aeneas. Aeneas was a cousin of King Priam. And he su survived the sack of Troy, supposedly. And he tells how, um, how uh, Aeneas fled and he went to like, he explored the Mediterranean. Like he went to like North Africa and he met uh, Queen Dido, who I'll may maybe mention later, was like the one of the leaders of the Carthaginians that founded the state. Met her. I think he wanted to marry her, but he decided not to. And then he went to Italy in Italy, he helped create a bunch of settlements there that they think were later future cities or city-states that would later be Latin, Roman-type states uh, that would, of course, merge later. They're called Latins because of the language, you know, Latin language. So, so they, yeah, that's kind of kind of what that is right there. I'll put that on the screen for you if you want. Uh, but, yeah, uh, and a lot of Romans <laughs> think that they're descended to Aeneas. Like, I think Julius Caesar, I think, and a bunch of other of these other Romans uh, a long time ago, thought they were related to Aeneas, uh, believe it or not. Uh, so I don't know if that's true or not, you know, uh, about whether the, you know, Romans are related to the Trojans. They, they may have been partially, possibly, you know, maybe some of the Trojans fled and settled in Italy. It's a possibility. Uh, but uh, the Romans in Italy itself, like there anyway, were really a mix of those three peoples, the Latin peoples, which, lived around like where the Tiber River is, like in central northern Italy, uh, the Greeks, which were on the southern part, so, southern part of Italy and Sicily, and the Etruscan peoples, which this short video talked about. Etruscans were these um, European peoples, Caucasian peoples, that lived in the Po River Valley, like in the way, way above Rome and the northern part of Italy, closer to the Alps. And they think the Etruscans heavily influenced the Romans you know, on a lot of, a lot of their ideas all that. Oh, and this is another writer, too, of course, who's big. He's very important. Uh, Plutarch, who was a Greek writer who I've kind of talked about before. I think we were talking about Alexander the Great. He was one of the guys that wrote about him. And uh, Plutarch is known for writing a series of biographies uh, about the Romans and the Greeks. He was writing about, I think he dates about 20, 2,000 to 2,100 years ago. Uh, Plutarch uh, was when he lived kind of lived at the beginning of the Roman Empire and all that. And uh, Plutarch has got a series of books that were called Parallel Lives. They're called that because he would compare um, Romans with with uh, Greeks, like a Greek guy with a Roman guy. Like an example, he compared like uh, Alexander the Great with um, Julius Caesar, because both were great conquerors, you know, and stuff like that. But Plutarch's got, um, he's got all kinds of sources, um, like he's got like Romulus and all the kings, a lot of them writing about him. Uh, Brutus, uh, the first Brutus anyway, that founded uh, the Roman Republic. Uh, Gaius Marius, Sola, uh, Mark Antony. Like you want to learn about Mark Antony and Cleopatra, he's the main source on that. Uh, Pompey, Crassus, Julius Caesar. I think he's got Octavian. Does he have Octavian? I can't remember. He might have Octavian too as well, but he's got all the important early Romans. I don't think he's got, he doesn't have Octavian. Uh, but he's got all the important Romans that are kind of under the Republic uh, and has biographies on them. And usually called the lies of the Roman nobles. I think they dub them uh, sometimes or something like that. So kind of kind of going into all these different sources that are out there uh, that where we get our information from. And of course, some of it, we're not sure if it's really accurate or not. I mean, some of those authors are prone to exaggeration later. Uh, and so we have to rely on other sources like archaeology and so on that might come up as well. All right, so um, kind of talk about the history of Rome a little. Now, Rome started out as a kingdom. Uh, the Roman kingdom 
lasts roughly about 753 to maybe about 510 BC. So it lasted over 200 years. Uh, and it started out as a small state that was basically around the Tiber area. So it's not a very big area. In fact, they believe Rome itself, I'll put it up on the screen, started out as a confederation of city-states originally. It wasn't like one state or whatever or city-state. It was mostly a bunch of states that were often called, I think now in modern times, they're dubbed the so-called Latin League. Uh, they're called, but the area itself was called Latium, which was, by the way, supposedly named after some kind of ancient king or chieftain that lived in that area who had the same, had a similar name. Uh, I think it was actually Latinus, is his name, L-A-T-I-N-U-S, Latinus. That's where we get the word Latin from, or uh, the term Latin for the peoples that lived there. And they had a bunch of city-states that were there uh, that were known like, uh, one of the big ones were um, Alba Longa was one of them that was there. But they had some you may have heard of named um, Tusculum, kind of where the word Tuscany comes from. Tusculum, Lavinium, I think it was another, Ardia, Tiber, spelled with a U, T-I-B-U-R. Uh, so it was all these kind of little city-states that were there. And then over time, it all kind of com combined into a Roman state, uh, more or less. And the city of Rome was, of course, believed to be, of course, built nearby uh, as well. But they only had seven kings uh, that, that reigned uh, roughly, with Romanus being the most famous uh, but later, the later um, Roman kings uh, were actually ruled by uh, foreigners, which were Etruscans that live in the north. Uh, like last three or four of them, I think, were Etruscan, more or less. And um, and the kings were very powerful. They had like um, kind of like almost like absolute power, uh, more or less, which was often described as being the word imperium. Just kind of get where you get the word imperial from later. So they had supreme royal power. Uh, although I'll explain later the Roman kings uh, had originally like some kind of um, advisory body of nobility, which will over time grow into like what they call the Roman Senate eventually. But like I said, the I think it's the last, I want to say, was it three or four? I can't remember exactly how many there were that they had. It looks like, um, yeah, I think the last three, the last three kings they had, they had the seven kings I'm talking about, were actually Etruscan. Uh, who lived up in the north, uh, like northern Italy, like around the Pope River Valley. And the Etruscans were believed to be older. They came back, uh, I think they went back to, I want to say, 1200 B.C. Uh, they first settled there, uh, it's believed. And um, a lot of the influences that the Romans get later, like, um, like gladiatorial events and things like that, and development of aqueducts that the Romans are kind of known for, they think that may have come from the Etruscans originally. So just some of those kind of ideas uh, came from them, and they kind of borrowed it uh, more or less. The region where the Etruscans lived was called Etruria. Here it's the word where they get the word Etruscan from. And from that word, they also get the word they think maybe that's actually it, uh, which is the word Tuscany, which is up there in the north. I think where Milan is and all that, Milano, uh, et cetera. So you take out the R and the E. Yeah, the R and the E at the front you get the word Tuscan or Tuscany uh, out of that word. Uh, of course, you see up in there at the top, uh, not the top right, but there's a symbol here. Where is it? I'll show you real quick here. But the Romans were known for a symbol which is very famous called the fasci. You've probably have seen it before, I'm sure. Uh, of course, it's where you get the word fascist from. I'll explain later. But the word, the fasci, was a famous Roman symbol. It supposedly means in Latin, bundle, or some people will say bundle of rods. It's basically a bundle of uh, wooden rods or sticks uh, that have an ax coming out of it. And it symbolizes like Roman power, especially of like the, the those in like authority that are in power, uh, the power to command, command, I think was, I think the term they sometimes would use for it. So basically gave people the power of authority or power and authority over others. So it could be like kings, it could be rulers, it could be magistrates, obviously it could be emperors, uh, of course, later. Quite often they were carried into battle uh, as well. That symbol you see on the left is a symbol that's often seen even today in our own government. Uh, the U.S. Congress, like in the House of Representatives, has the fasci symbols carved on the walls. I don't you didn't know that. 
I think they're on both sides where the Speaker of the House is and all that. There are some, and of course, you often see with the eagle. The eagle, of course, was a major symbol, of course, uh, of, of Rome. I know people think of like the Nazis later using the, the eagle symbol, you know. Uh, looks like that, doesn't it? But um, the eagle symbol was something that Gaius Marius adopted. And I'm wearing it too, the eagle, you know, which is up there with the, I would talk about the SPQR, what that is, of course, what they called Rome. Uh, and um, but the eagle symbol, something that Gaius Marius developed a long time ago, had to do with the story that supposedly Marius was, um, when he was a kid, he found an eagle's nest. And most eagle's nests are supposed to have only two or three eggs in it. He found seven. So it was a symbol of luck. And so later, uh, Marius decided that the eagle would be the symbol of Rome. Uh, and then he would put it on standards. So all Roman standards would have an eagle symbol for luck, you know, stuff like that. But the fashion, you know, is kind of controversial because later it was borrowed by Benito Mussolini of Italy, of course, <laughs> uh, with the so-called fascist movement, you know, which was a right wing movement that started in the 1900s, 20th century. And so it's often been symbolized with the whole fascist fascism movement uh, that was being like, you know, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis uh, and all that. And so that's what people think of today. But a long time ago, it was, you know, considered that it was more associated with the, of course, with the Romans, of course, a long time ago. Oh, and I was talking about the um, Roman Roman uh, Senate, which I'll get more into later. But uh, like I said, the Roman Senate started out as an advisory body of the nobility. So all the wealthy nobility aristocrats that were under the king. Uh, which I'll get to later. So they're called the so-called patricians, patrician class. They're called, they later basically advise the king on what to do. And then the king would decide, you know, in the end, what would happen politically or whatever. Uh, and then you know, later it became a political, you know, institution under the Roman Republic uh, and also the empire. Uh, it was mostly a governing body that could create laws, and et cetera. But Mostly it was used to advise people. It was like a deliberating body like the U.S. Senate is, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, and um, But later, you know, it becomes like it starts as the empire comes in later with the emperors. It more and more over time will become like a like a rubber stamp, <laughs> more or less, you know, like the monarch just pretty much does whatever he wants, the emperors. So over time. So it depends on the time period when it exists, the Roman Senate. All right, let me get into, and of course, I need to talk about what happens. Of course, the Romans don't keep a monarchy forever, you know, about this. Uh, and what happens later, they eventually, uh, of course, switch to becoming a republic, uh, more of a dip, uh, uh, representative democracy, uh, which eventually occurs. And um, what happened to cause it was an incident that occurred around 50. Five, five, I think it was 510, 509 BC is kind of a debate about when it started. Maybe I think it was 510 BC is what happened, actually. But uh, 509 BC, the Romans switched to a Rome to a republic, which what you can see there lasted from 509 BC to 20 B, 27 BC. And there was a king named Tarkin the Proud. They called him Tarkin Superbus. He was the seventh king, the last king course, of the Romans, of course, of Etruscan origin. Uh, and uh, apparently there was an incident that happened under his reign. Um, they think it was in 510, I think was the correct correct date it was. But there was a, a Roman noblewoman named Lucretia. Uh, and apparently uh, the king's son, by the way, apparently the name was, um, it's kind of ironic about this, but his name was um, Sextus. S-E-X-T-U-S, Sextus. <laughs> That's kind of ironic, the name. But he made a bet with a friend, I think it was, and he said that he could sleep with uh, Lucretia. Uh, and so, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. And so tried to do it, and she wouldn't do it. She was married, of course. And so he raped her at, gun, at, at uh, knife point, uh, you can see. That's like a painting, I think, that was – I guess that's Titian. He was a famous painting, I guess, painter that's uh, – I guess around the Renaissance period, I guess it is. And um, and so she was so embarrassed about it that, if you know about it, she killed herself. She committed suicide because uh, she was had been raped. Uh, and so uh, what happened was um, she had this uncle of, of hers, 
named uh, Brutus, Lucius Junius Brutus was his full name. And her husband, Lucius Tarquinius, um, he also got involved. Uh, and they basically got the Roman people to overthrow the king. Uh, Tar Tarquinius the Proud overthrew him, basically kicked him out, and they decided to establish a Roman Republic. And so both Brutus and Lucius Tarquinius, of course, became, the I guess, the two main co-rulers that would create uh, the um, the Roman Republic. And they would replace the kings later with what they call Roman consuls, which I think Brutus was one of the first consuls to uh, be in power. And uh, this state uh, was like, uh, if you study about the Roman Republic, it's, 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 it's a representative type democracy. That's basically what it is, more or less, that the kind of government that they created. But You'll see later it's more controlled by those that have, you know, wealth and so on, land, the wealthy upper class elite, those kind of types. Uh, and so in a sense, it was like a representative democracy, but it was kind of like almost like an oligarchy the way it was with the Romans. So mostly the wealthy people had control of everything and then common people really didn't have as much power, uh, more or less. By the way, the word Republic, Republican, which is kind of used today a lot, uh, comes from actually two Latin words, res publica, uh, which can actually translate as either being commonwealth or dealing with the public affairs of the people, you know. And the Roman Republic is the longest republic in history. There's, nobody's broken it yet so far. About four, I guess you want to count, I'm not sure exactly that's right or not, but 488 years might be the date if you date it from. I guess 509 when they think it was founded, and then 27 BC, they think that's the date when um, Octavian became Augustus. Uh, they, he adopted the title, and so they think that's maybe officially when uh, the um, the empire began, Roman Empire began with emperors. Although it's kind of debated that some people think that the Republic ended when Julius Caesar was killed, assassinated in 44 BC. So it's kind of a debate about how long it really is. But it's almost 500 years, and I think we're like two, 300 years, and I guess we're gaining on it. Um, so I think we're, we're, we might be the second oldest, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, now, um, the Roman Republic uh, in its government was called a name, which I'll uh, talk about. It was called SPQR, which you may have heard of that before. Of course, you've already seen it up there on the top right. That's mostly what they call the government of Rome. I think people also use it to describe the Republic as well, uh, more or less. But it stands for Senatus Populus Romanus. That's basically what it means. Um, actually, the Q uh, is in the populus. It's actually, you see it right there at the end of the populus. You see the Q there. So you got the, um, go on the screen here, but uh, you've got the, um, you got the S, Right here, you got the P. Well, you can't see that. Hold on a second. Let me show you real quick so you won't be confused. But basically, you've got the um, the S right here, P, then you got the Q, then you got the R. So you'll notice, by the way, that um, there's, um, <laughs> there's no periods. I don't know if you see that or not. Uh, no periods because there's no there was no punctuation yet at that point. So... So they, they didn't have periods. Uh, it was enchanted. Like, it's not US, you know, USA, USA. No, they didn't do SPQR, anything like that. Uh, but they did put it on buildings. They put it on standards. They put it on flags. So it might be spelled out probably on standards. That obviously, they had to initial it SPQR on stuff like that. Uh, so that's something you'll often see uh, more or less all over the place. And you still see it on, like, old buildings like in Italy today, uh, written out. All right, let me also talk about uh, the fact that uh, they, in Rome, they had different um, social classes, as you see right here, uh, right there. Uh, there's, I, I, actually, I've got two on there, but I'll kind of go through some other ones that existed as well. The two main ones they had, uh, well, the first was called the patricians that they had. The patricians were basically what we call the upper class. Uh, so they, they, they're kind of like an aristocracy class of people, nobility, you want to call them that. And um, 
they they descended from like the uh, there's a typo there that should be they, they descended from the founders of Rome, uh, which uh, the word patrician comes from the word pater, p a t e r, which in Latin means father. You know, mater is for mother, right? Like maternity, basically, where it comes from. Um, so pater father. So they believe. I think the theory was was that the patricians. Uh, Descended back to Romulus and Remus, right? Yeah, Romulus, I guess, and Remus and all that. They founded the city. And I think even some of you thought they went back to Aeneas and the Trojans and stuff like that. So patricians were very wealthy. They had all the power. They had all the money. They had all the, all the land. Uh, they controlled all the high positions in government, the military, even the high priests. At one point, of course, were all controlled pretty much by that main group, uh, more or less. Uh, then you have another one that's on the bottom, of course, the plebes are called plebeians, usually, uh, usually plebes for short. Uh, they're the so-called common people. Most were peasants, like farmers, et cetera. And um, they had less power, less wealth, less land, obviously, more or less. Uh, and so majority of the Romans were plebes. Okay, how about exactly the number or whatever, but it was probably at least three-fourths. You know, may have been, maybe not that, maybe at least somewhere in that range, I would say two thirds or more were probably plebeian. Um, quite, they have also the equestrian class. That's not really on that PowerPoint slide, but the equestrians also called the equites or knights uh, is a type of cavalry type social class uh, that kind of emerged during the Roman Republic. It kind of came out of the cavalry, it became like a wealthy business class. It would be kind of like a um, upper middle class might be, I guess, the best thing to describe what it is. And it would be like between the patricians who are at the top and you got the equestrian below them and the plebes on the bottom. So that's kind of the order of it, uh, basically. But the equestrians were pretty wealthy and even some of the famous political leaders and I think some of the emperors came out of the equestrian class uh, also as well. Uh, also, I'll mention, too, while I'm at it, uh, slaves and women. Slaves are on the kind of on the bottom, for sure, because uh, they're not considered you know, Roman citizens. They made up a good chunk of the population. So anywhere from a third to a fourth of uh, the Roman um, population was pretty much slave, because, you know, the Romans conquered a lot of people, and so they, they enslaved a lot of people. And just about everything you look at in the Roman world from roads to buildings and so on, aqueducts, bridges, where majority of them were built by slaves. Like behind me, I've got the Roman Colosseum in Rome. It was built, they think, by mostly Jewish slaves uh, that were basically taken uh, in the, um, I think, the Second Jewish-Roman War, uh, which, which was fought the first century when the Romans destroyed the Second Temple of, of Jerusalem. So, uh, and then uh, women, of course, didn't have much equal rights with men. So the, they were almost like kind of like second class citizens, uh, more or less. Um, but men were considered the head of the household. Uh, you may have heard the term paterfamilia, of course, being used uh, for that. So they pretty much could decide anything like with their daughters. Like if they don't, for some reason, a daughter marries them, this man and they don't like the guy anymore, they tell her, divorce him. <laughs> and you marry this other guy. <laughs> Pretty much had control. Uh, also, women couldn't inherit stuff. So, um, like land or whatever, money. Uh, and so a lot of times, if like a man didn't have a like a son, he would have to adopt a son and then give everything to him. So that's kind of the way it was, uh, more or less. Um, so obviously it's important for a woman to marry somebody that was you know, you know up up outstanding, up, you know, up up upstanding kind of person, or whatever. Um, oh, uh, oh, of course, we're talking about assemblies and all that stuff uh, as well. But, but patricians and plebes uh, had their own separate like assemblies, which the Romans called an assembly a consul, just like the Greeks did uh, as well, which they had like four or five of them they had more or less. But the patricians mostly had the Roman Senate, uh, more or less. And Roman Senate was more or less um, dominant in dealing with like wealthy things, uh, that wealthy, wealthy, you know, you know, um, concerns or whatever. Plebes were more concerned with 
they're around assembly, the plebeian consul. It's called all kinds of names, peoples, the peoples or popular consul uh, as well. Uh, and um, they were more uh, obviously dealing with like the poor peoples and their concerns, protecting their property and their rights and all that. They have some other ones. They have the tribal consul because the Romans separate themselves into like tribes, like the Greeks, you know, had also as well. Centurion consul or assembly, uh, of course, was like one for the military, the Roman army. I think they had one more that was called a comitia assembly or consul. They had like five of them, I know, that they had. So they had a lot of them, these assemblies overall. Uh, let me go through two. Now, the Romans uh, also, uh, a lot of the people that ran the state uh, were uh, mostly run by what we call magistrates because so, they got rid of the king, you know, and all that. Uh, so they brought in these magistrates, which, the you know, the Greeks had the same thing, like archons, et cetera, all that that they had. Uh, and uh, these these were mostly either elected officials or they were appointed, mostly elected. In fact, a lot of, a lot of the elected offices were usually one-year terms. Uh, and um, they helped run the government. Of course, the most famous one, that they had, that they elected, was, of course, the Roman consul. You know, they had two of them. Uh, they were elected usually together on a ticket, kind of like a president, vice president. Uh, and so, as the highest elected magistrate uh, that was that could be in power. And what did the consul do? He did all kinds of things. He could create laws. Uh, he dealt with the Roman Senate, especially. He could act as a judge, like he could be like in court cases. He could act as a judge to decide court cases in general. He was a commander in chief of the armed forces, so like the legions. Uh, he would lead them in battle quite often. And usually they would be elected by the male citizens, usually, you know, for one year terms. And what, quite often they would run on tickets together, like two consuls would run together, like two politicians. Kind of like now, you got these, you know, two politicians like what Biden versus Trump, you know, and they would have two consuls that would run together against each other or maybe more than two pairs, maybe. And whoever got the most votes would become the two consuls, uh, more or less. Oh, you see there, uh, that, what's the deal with the number? You see it says 40 in parentheses. Uh, that was around the average age uh, that you, I think the minimum age was about 40 that you could run for being a consul. 40 or 42, depending on what your social standing was. I think 40 for patricians and 42 for plebes or something like that. Uh, of course, Roman consuls were known for having what they call veto power. So they could veto like a certain like law or bill or something being created. Uh, they could even veto other magistrates. I think they could even veto the other consul, you know, counsel them out. Uh, the word veto is a Latin word meaning I forbid. Uh, and of course, today you see it, you know, in modern times with governors and presidents being able to veto stuff like laws and so on. Uh, quite often you just couldn't be consul, you know, like it wasn't a deal where uh, like you, you're, you're a nobody and you run for president, uh, that kind of thing. A lot of times the consul had to have military experience. I think at least 10 years of service uh, that you had to have and you were in the military, unless you were a general or something like that, like maybe like Julius Caesar, that kind of thing. Um, then they wanted you to have political experience. So they wanted you to start at the bottom, like some of the lower magistrates and work your way up. Uh, and so the Romans had this thing called the honorable course, which in Latin was called cursus honorum, where you had to start at the bottom and work your way up to some upper magistrates that were there. So that might be like on the bottom, you would start being like what they call a quaestor. Basically, that'd be like one of the lower magistrates uh, that you'd start at. And you can see that at a minimum age, 30 was the minimum age you had to be uh, to run as a, as a quaestor. Of course, all men, no women could run. And quaestors dealt with like uh, treasury. What I mean by that is they dealt with like the, the, the money, They're the money men. They count the money and deal with the Roman treasury, banking system, and things like that. Uh, and uh, usually there were a bunch of those uh, that were elected to that position, which I forget how many there were, about 15, 20 of them. It just depends on what time period we're talking about. Uh, but there was a bunch of them that would, of course, run for that position, which I think was like usually a one-year term. But they had a dilly, I think they say it. 
It's another one that was a lower magistrate. You had to be at least 36 to, to run for that one. And the uh, Adeli, uh, what they did was they dealt with like, uh, they ran the public games. That would be like a fun job, you know. Cause so so behind me, you got the Roman Coliseum. So these are the guys that would schedule all the games and stuff like that, put on the gladiatorial events, and things like that. Uh, they also dealt with, um, well, you can't see it behind me, but yeah, the Coliseum back there I meant before, of course. But, um, but basically, um, they dealt with that. They ran the temples also as well. So public games, they ran all the temples, things like that as well. Praetor was an upper magistrative position. You had to be 39 to be elected to that one. They dealt with judicial stuff, law. So they're kind of like the judge and lawyers of the state. Uh, there's usually about 15, 20 of those. I forget how many Adelis they had. It was only a few of those, like maybe five. There weren't that many of those. I know they were elected to that one. Uh, but um, usually there was a bunch of praetors that were also there. Uh, there was one called a censor. Uh, there was another magistrate. That was a very prestigious one uh, to be elected to because it was a five-year term. They got elected to it. Uh, they had two censors that they had that they would elect every five years. What did they do? They did a lot of things. They were the ones that dealt with the Roman census, which, you know, if you know about that, was done every five years. Uh, they would do a head count to figure out citizenship and taxation, like how much money to tax people uh, and all that. You read, you know, the Bible, how Jesus, Jesus' family is going to, I guess, Jer Jerusalem or whatever because of the census and all that stuff. Yeah, that's what the Romans were kind of known for uh, and all of that. Uh, the censor also built public works. So he would be in charge of building, like I said, that Colosseum you saw behind me earlier. Um, you would build buildings like that public buildings usually. He built roads. He built bridges. He also dealt with public morality uh, as well. Oh, and by the way, the censor is the one that would nominate or select people to be a Roman senator. You weren't elected like popular vote. Uh, but later the Roman emperors would put everybody in later, all these magistrative positions anyway. Oh, Pontifex Max, you may have heard of that. A uh, high priest, of course, the Roman high priest which that was an elected position too, I think a one-year term maybe. Uh, and uh, they were involved with planning the Roman calendar and dealing with the temples uh, and stuff like that. That was a pre pretty prestigious position too, if you got elected to it. And uh, I always talk about the story about the fact that supposedly the uh, high priest was the position that uh, Julius Caesar first ran for politically and won. Uh, you dealt with the Vestal Virgins, you know, and all that. You may have heard of them. Uh, they were part of them. Part of that also as well. Oh, one more magistrate I will mention before I move on. They had what they called the uh, so-called tribunes. Um, you know, tribunes were a type of plebe plebeian magistrate that dealt with like they protected plebeian rights, plebeian property, and so on. And uh, they uh, these were lower magistrates that were popular for a while, and uh, they they elected ten of these a year. I think the one year terms. And uh, the Tribune had what they call veto power. They're kind of almost considered like a rival to some of the other magistrates. Uh, and they were popular up to like around the second century BC. You may have heard of uh, Tiberius Gracchus, the Gracchi brothers. I think were famous Tribunes. They were plebes. Uh, and uh, they were powerful for a while, but over time they declined overall. Uh, one more thing I'll talk about as well before uh, I'll move on. But um, also um, the Romans were marked with, because you had all these social classes that you had uh, more or less, uh, the Romans had a lot of struggle between the plebes and patricians. There was a deal where the two got into a bunch of political social conflicts, conflict of the orders it was called, or the struggle of the orders, uh, which they think occurred in the 5th century B.C., after the Republic formed. Uh, and so before that, the plebes were kind of segregated. Uh, they couldn't have any real political power, social power. Even in the military, they didn't have any power. They couldn't be elected to high priests, uh, things like that. And so over time, it led to this conflict where it was almost like open war 
uh, between both sides. Uh, and um, started around 494 BC, may have gone from the 5th to maybe into the 4th century BC a little bit either as well, but most happened in the 5th century BC. And um, the plebes um, ended up going on strike. Most of the plebeians made up the Roman army like a majority. Uh, and so they decided that they would strike. Uh, they also decided they wouldn't do any kind of business with the patricians, like boycott that uh, as well. And so over time, it forced the patricians to kind of give in and give them more rights, which is eventually what happened uh, over time with the uh, struggle of the orders or the conflict of the orders, either one it's called. So that's how they end up the plebes end up getting their own assembly that I talked about before, the so-called plebeian council, which it's got all kinds of names. It's called the people's council or the popular council. I think they call it too as well. It was created in 471 BC. That's when it was founded. And um, so they got that. They even got their own magistrates uh, as well that went with the plebeian assembly, uh, which was called the tribunes I talked about already. Uh, enslavement for debt was ended, which was something that they had before, like in Greece. Uh, like they'd pay your debts, they would imprison you. They got rid of that uh, as well. And then you see their marriage laws were lax or laxed. Uh, what I mean by that is that the plebes and patricians can now marry each other because before that, the social classes couldn't marry each other. So that was forbidden. But now you start to see kind of a blending of the two classes later. And uh, over time, the two will kind of disappear and you won't really see it as much. Like when you get to the empire, it kind of, you don't see that as much, the two different uh, social classes, but uh, they exist mostly in the, in the Republic. Uh, oh, and one more, uh, one more thing I'll talk about this period too as well. Also, uh, the Romans at the time, like in the fifth century BC, even wrote up a set of um, laws that's around 451 BC, which were called the 12 Tables actually means tablets uh, from Latin. And uh, these were a set of um, written Roman laws, law codes, etc. Uh, they were written on 12 tablets, hence the name being used. And uh, these laws were eventually placed in the Roman Forum. Uh, at first, what happened was the plebes created them to kind of settle disputes between the plebes and the patricians. But over time, what happened was it went on to become basically basically the basis of Roman law, the Roman constitution, uh, and, and the legal codes uh, that went with it. So over time, it kind of became this uh, civil and criminal code type system that they developed in Rome. Uh, and uh, it mostly was, you know, geared towards protecting people's, like, rights, people's uh, property. Uh, but mostly those that were free citizens and not really those that were like, say, slaves. I don't know if they included women as much either. It's mostly just men, geared towards men, uh, more or less. All right. So uh, anyway, um, now um, I need to also talk about a few minutes left. Uh, also, the Roman Forum. That that's something you're going to see later uh, as well. Uh, that's going to be important. Of course, Roman life um, overall. Uh, and uh, the Roman Forum is called all kinds of names. Uh, some people think the, the Roman Forum was originally called the uh, just the Forum or also known as the Forum Mag Magnum. That's, the, that's, of course, the name that they often call it, which means in Latin, the Great Forum uh, overall. And um, like it says, Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, Rome was built over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, by different people, different politicians, even different emperors contribute to the construction, expanding, even building their own forums and all that, uh, more or less. Uh, but it's the place where everybody would meet, you know, hobnob, where, you know, the, even the upper classes would meet, could meet with the lower classes in a sense. Uh, and um, the Roman Forum was kind of like a, uh, it's like a, kind of like a, a town square. That would be about the best way to basically put here's of course some pictures of the ruins from the Roman Forum you can see here that's the uh, Palatine Hill which is up here part of it 
that's believed to be an older palace of like one of maybe like Tiberius Caligula. And I think maybe Augustus palace was up in there somewhere um, also as well. But most of the Roman form today, of course, uh, is in ruins. Um, you know, pretty much it's like a plaza would be kind of what it is. It's kind of similar to like almost like comparable to the Agora, maybe I talked about before, and the Acropolis, but everything was there, you know, within walking distance, you know, marketplaces, baths, temples, government buildings, uh, theaters, uh, the Colosseum was nearby, the Circus Maximus is nearby. Uh, so, so yeah, and, um, and of course, they all say it, all all roads lead to Rome. So everything leads to, of course, uh, there, um, like the Apian Way, which, you know, goes from the south, southern Italy to Rome, would be like the main road coming in, you know, to where the Roman Forum is overall. But you can see most of it today is in ruins. Uh, that's mostly just due to the decline of Rome and all the different wars uh, that were fought like a long time ago uh, in Rome. Uh, and so, like every every pretty much every city, like Roman city, had something comparable to that. Like if you go to Pompeii, the ruins of Pompeii, they kind of have a forum too as well. That's kind of comparable to that as well. They might have amphitheaters there, like at Pom Pompeii, you know, et cetera. Uh, overall, but you can say, yeah, like it's mostly a bunch of ruins. You know, a lot of it's just torn down or fell down uh, over time. There's even some cases where some buildings around there were even converted into like temples or converted into like churches and stuff like that by the Catholic Church later. All right. Uh, of course, uh, I will be talking about more later. I don't know if I have time today to really get into it. But of course, I will be getting into, of course, talking a little bit about the Punic Wars. Uh, let me just spend a few minutes on it right now, talking about what it was. But the Punic Wars were a, a series of wars that come later, which are between the Roman Republic and, of course, the Carthaginian Empire. So it's kind of often called Rome versus Carthage, of course, the name uh, that they often use, uh, more or less. And um, this is a series of wars which last from the 3rd century to the 2nd century BC, it lasts over 100 years off and on. And were, by the way, considered to be some of the bloodiest wars that were ever fought uh, in Roman times. I uh, forget how many people were died, but it was probably a couple million died uh, in this conflict. Uh, and um, it's important, these wars, by the way, because these wars were will eventually lead to the rise of the Roman Empire because the Rome's going to start taking over parts of Western Europe. They'll take over North Africa. And then from there, they'll even start pushing into like Eastern Europe, the rest of North Africa. They'll eventually take conquer the whole thing uh, around, of course, the, um, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, more or less. And uh, Carthage um, is, a, of course, we've talked about it before, but it's a multinational empire that was believed to have been founded close to about 900 B.C. by the Phoenicians. But over time, it became this multi multi ethnic empire of different peoples that live in North Africa, like Africans and Berber, um, Celtic people in Spain, um, even some people in Northern Italy, I think kind of joined it for a while as well. They believe it was actually founded by a woman um, about 900 BC, a woman named Queen Dido, who migrated from what is uh, where Phoenicia is, and she eventually bought some land there in North Africa and started building the city of Carthage. And so Carthage was actually founded where Tunisia is. You are the city of Tunis, which is the capital of Tunisia today. It's kind of sandwiched between um, where uh, Algeria is and Libya. That's where Tunisia is. And uh, Carthage would go on to be this trading empire that was known for its you know merchants and uh, strong naval power and presence, uh, mostly in the Western Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and they are great sailors, the Carthaginians, even sailing into the Atlantic Ocean, uh, they think, as well. And the empire itself would be massive. Over time, it's going to eventually spread to North Africa, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, and Spain. Uh, and, of course, the Romans later uh, will call them another name, uh, which is the word Punic or Punicus, 
uh, which the, the word Punicus, or even the Greek word Punici, uh, was, of course, the name that um, meant Phoenician. So they called them by the old name, the so-called purple people that we talked about that the Phoenicians were called. And that's what the word Punic Wars means. It means the Phoenician Wars. So they, they kind of knew who they were fighting, the Romans, uh, more or less, uh, in these wars. And um, we'll get more into uh, talking about uh, the Punic Wars uh, next time, uh, more or less. Um, I'm kind of running out of time. Probably I don't want to go over too much today, uh, lecture-wise. But I'll get more into uh, the Punic Wars with another lecture next time. Uh, and then I'll, of course, get into, um, I think next Monday, we should be able to start working on like the later part of the Roman Republic. I'll get into like the rise of the empire, really. It starts in the Republic, talking about all these different dictators that rose to power, like Marius and Sola, Julius Caesar, uh, et cetera. And so um, I guess that'll be it for today. Uh, before I go, though, I want to remind you about um, some upcoming uh, assignments due. Don't forget about all those assignments I got posted. I think the China one's going to expire tonight. So go ahead and start trying to wrap that one up. Uh, you also got the Thermopylae video quiz to kind of finish up with that as well. And don't forget, I've already put up, you know, the SAM. You can start working on that early. That'll be due probably sometime next week. In the, probably in the next week, I might let, let it open for that long the time. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, if anybody has any uh, questions, let me know. I guess there's no questions on here. I see today stuff up in the comments, but no questions right now, I guess, about this lecture. So I know later on YouTube, I know I'm streaming this to another YouTube channel, uh, which I don't, I'm not going to put it there. I'm going to take it down later, but I'll um, put it up on my main YouTube channel later because I want to put everything in the same spot pretty much. So that's it for today. Y'all take care. I guess watch the storm, what happens, because I don't know what's going to happen exactly. Uh, the storm is going to do any close school down, but just be watching the news about that and from the what happens. So y'all take care. Have a good coming up, by the way. And I'll see you in another lecture. So y'all take care.